right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day just to be alive, courtesy of your grace and mercy. We know we deserve nothing. We know we're all sinners before you, but you and your great love and great mercy have come down from heaven, taking the form of a man, willingly being judged for our sins, so that whoever trusts in you will be saved by your grace. Father, we thank you for the good news, and we thank you that you acted upon your love for us, that you did something, whatever it took to save us. Father, we pray for those who are sick, those who are struggling in our church family. You know who they are and what they need. We pray especially spiritually that you give them peace and confidence in who you are and that you have a reason for everything. Father, we ask that you bless this message. Guide us by your spirit and teach us by your spirit. It's in Christ's precious name we pray by the power of your spirit. Amen. All right, once again on the board. What is good, and who gets to define it? Obviously, we've been learning about this, and that really God is the only one that really gets to define good, the only one that truly is good. And um, we shouldn't be giving into our own opinions on what is good, because usually they come from the world and not from the Word. So let's just start today with this thought. Part of the perfect goodness of God is his perfect faithfulness. You know, God is good. He, he, he just is like, he can't do bad. All good things come from our father above all the evil in the world. This is called the devil's world temporarily. And that explains a lot of what's going on, but God is good. And one of the best parts of his goodness for us is his perfect faithfulness perfect faithfulness. So when he says he's going to do something, he does it. He even has to do it based on his own word. He can't violate his own word. He can't lie, which is why we need to keep learning the word to see all the things he he promises and things he tells us that we can rely on. So I was thinking about this during our lessons in this series about his perfect faithfulness. If God's faithfulness were not perfect and good, where would we be? Where would we be if he wasn't perfectly faithful? We'd be wondering and hoping and praying every day that God would be faithful to us. For example, he says he forgives us, right? If we repent and we turn to his son, we receive forgiveness from him. But can you imagine if it says that, but then at the same time it says, you know, in so many words, God doesn't have to be faithful. He could change his mind at any moment. Where's the security in that? Where would we be? It would be a horrible, uh, fearful existence. But God is perfectly faithful. On the board in 2 Timothy 2.13, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And remember, Jesus is the word of God, too, according to the scriptures. So he cannot deny himself. He can't deny his word either. It's who he is. As we've heard from a variety of perspectives lately, God never fails. God never fails. You see, the only reason we probably question that or or wonder if he fails is because we all fail. We're used to people around us failing. So like, could God really be perfect? We might say to ourselves. But scripture tells us God never fails. He's so perfectly faithful that he completes whatever he promises. It's just how it is. And like I think uh, this has come up in the past, if you, if you happen to be fortunate enough to know one or two people in your life that you trust their word explicitly, that you could say, you know, they said it, it's done. You know, will you have that kind of confidence in somebody? Even though we're all sinners. You might be lucky to have a man or a woman in your life that has that kind of integrity where you wouldn't even question 
whether they're going to follow through on something they told you or not. What a blessing that is. But God, he's perfectly faithful, and he completes whatever he promises. From revealing himself to mankind, as he promises in Romans 1, I will reveal myself through creation, and all the way to keeping his believers saved, as he promises. He's perfectly faithful. The Spirit's been emphasizing several things through these lessons, and one of them is the importance of relying on the Word of God and the perfect goodness of it, the perfection of the Word, relying on that, because we can. On the board, we've been talking about the inerrant Word. The Bible is the Word of God. It must be taken for exactly that, nothing less. As soon as man tries to reduce its perfectness, it is no longer the inspired word by definition, but rather something pliable. In other words, it's either inspired or it's not. You can't pick and choose. Who are you to say, oh, you know what, I like this verse or this chapter. That's, that makes sense to me, so I'll take that from God. But that can't be from God because it, I disagree with it. So now you're God? Who are we to interject ourselves in that, you know, decision about what's right and wrong or what's inspired or what's not? The word is inspired. And as soon as you start to mess with that or doubt that and you make it pliable, you, you've just ruined it for your own life. Um, in other words, again, you, do you consider it inspired or not? Many people in their arrogance do this very thing on the board, kind of getting in the way. And then they're trapped in their own arrogance too, relying on their own opinions and hopes for stability, which cannot give stability. But that's what people do. I met a couple of religious people uh, last week, and they were saying, oh, well, you know, I like some of the Bible, but not all of it. And so I believe some's from God and not all of it. Well, now you're trapped, in your own, you're trapped into relying on yourself, and your, your life is now a bunch of wishing and hoping that God's faithful, for example, or that what I believe is true, my opinion, I hope it's true, I hope I'm right. So now there's tremendous instability in that person's life, all because of arrogance, all because of not submitting to the Bible as the Word of God in their life. If they did that, they'd have perfect stability. They'd have peace. They'd have contentment. It's only when we get in the way. The only perfectly stable thing in this world is the Word, which again is Jesus Christ himself. And Scripture tells us on the board in Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He doesn't waver. God's truth doesn't change, whether it's 6,000 years ago or 1,000 years from now. God's truth is God's truth. God's word is God's word. So it's foolishness for us to pick and choose or to um, say it's out of, you know, not in vogue anymore. Now, we're, now our society is so advanced. So for 6,000 years, you know, it was good. But the last 100 years or so, you know, let's move on. arrogance, pride. We were also reminded on Sunday to rely on the Word of God and the Spirit to convict people. In other words, we can't, this came out on Sunday, we can't convict someone else's slave or servant. And really, who are we to convict someone else's servant? Where everyone's really God's servant, whether they admit it or not, they belong to God. So we can't convict someone like that. We're simply messengers who carry the message, deliver God's message. On the board we saw in John 16, 8, and the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Who's going to convict the world? The Holy Spirit. God's word says that's what's going to happen. That's what has happened. That's what continues to happen. It'll happen till the end of human history. 
So God, the Holy Spirit, convicts the world of things they need to realize. We just carry on the message and share it. So here we have on the board divine goodness at work. God's perfect faithfulness at work. No one's left in the dark. No one's not told the truth about God being their creator. God promises to reveal it to everyone, even if they don't know yet. Maybe they're a young person. Maybe they are going, you know, running down their own path of life right now, totally dizzy with the world, so to speak. Maybe they're just not ready yet, but God promises that he will reveal himself to everybody in his word. And he does it through the Holy Spirit. So we can relax. The onus is not on us. We're not convincers. We're not persuaders. We're not salesmen. We should be and could be passionate about God's word. But our job is to accurately share the message. So on the board, uh, we heard this quote on Sunday from Charles Spurgeon. And I wanted to put it up here because it's a great quote. And it's really just a great perspective. He says, A great many learned men are defending the gospel. No doubt it is a very proper and right thing to do. Yet I always notice that when there are most books of that kind, it is because the gospel itself is not being preached. That's a very, um, you know, wise statement. Why all these books? Why are these books writing about the gospel? Why aren't we just preaching the gospel, like from the book? Why do we rely on commentaries, for example, as our main source of truth? But anyway, uh, again, he says, I always notice that when there are most books of that kind, it is because the gospel itself is not being preached. Suppose a number of persons were to take it into their heads that they had to defend a lion. There he is in the cage, and here come all the soldiers of the army to fight for him. Well, I should suggest to them, if they would not object and feel that it was humbling to them, that they should kindly stand back and open the door and let the lion out. I believe that would be the best way of defending him, for he would take care of himself. And the best apology for the gospel is to let the gospel out. Do we use words sometimes to share the gospel? Absolutely. Let it out. But it doesn't mean you have to fight for them or persuade people. It means that the word, especially when you're quoting scripture, is going to do its work in people by the Holy Spirit. We have to trust that. And then Spurgeon goes on to say, never mind about defending De Deuteronomy or the whole of the Pentateuch. Um, You've heard pastors say many times over the years how we can get caught up in the weeds. We can get caught up in studying a lot of nitty-gritty details in the Word and, and not keep the big picture in mind. Well, I love how he says that. You know, sometimes you can get caught up in a book and you're not even preaching the gospel anymore. He says, preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let the lion out and see who will dare to approach Him. The lion of the tribe of Judah, that's Jesus Christ, will soon drive away all his adversaries. He doesn't need us to uh, convince people or convict people. He doesn't need us at all. He lets us be part of his plan. He lets us carry the message of the good news, but he doesn't need us. He's a lion. It's like a lion needing a soldier. Pretty good analogy. So let this perspective deliver you from putting a heavy weight on yourself regarding the gospel. Uh, we're all called to the, to the Great Commission, you know, to go make disciples in all the world for Jesus Christ and, and tell them about him and teach them the word. We're all told to do that. That's awesome. But the results are not on us. Who believes and who does not is not on us. It's on the Spirit. So lean heavily on the Lord. Like put all your weight on the Lord and his word. Like do you, ever, do you ever lean on somebody when you're really tired? Maybe you just climbed a mountain or something. You know, and you're out of breath, you're exhausted, and you lean on somebody. 
But we're not, we're not talking about just, you know, leaning on them, you know, for a little help. We're talking about leaning on them with all your weight. You can't stand anymore. That kind of thing. That's how we should be leaning on God every day. And not relying on our own wisdom, our own power. So anyway, this comes back to the word. On the board, regarding the inerrant word. Once we understand and accept that the Bible is the very word of God and that it's the final authority on all things, then and only then can we press on with full assurance of faith. People want full assurance in their lives, don't they? Don't you want confidence, knowing where you're going, for example, when you die? So you want full assurance, but you want to do it your own way? And where else are you going to find evidence of truth about what life's about? other than the Bible. But you want to pick and choose and have life your way. And if you do that, you will be absent of the full assurance of faith that God wants you to have, the peace, the contentment. Again, on the board, once we understand and accept that the Bible is the very word of God and that it is the final authority on all things, you're like, what do I do in this area of my life? What do I do in that area of my life? Read your Bible. It addresses every area of life many times but do you want God's answer do you want the truth or do you want to keep fabricating your own design so to speak and keep stumbling and keep suffering keep being miserable only God's word will give us peace and you have to have this kind of um, um, acceptance of God's word that it's the final authority if you want full assurance of faith and wisdom will rest on that thing right there Calvin said this uh, regarding convicting others of the truth. Those who wish to prove to unbelievers that Scripture is the Word of God are acting foolishly. For only by faith can this be known. There are people out there that read the Bible just to gather knowledge, to try to be smart about everything. All right, or they'll read it as a history book, but without believing that it's the word of God, it's the message of God. And um, that's between them and the Lord. The Lord's trying to convict them. He's not going to force anybody, but he is trying to convict them. Only by faith can someone conclude the Bible's the word of God. We can't convince people. Share the truth. Trust the Holy Spirit to do his thing. We might say we can lead the horse to water, but we can't make it drink. And that's okay. That's our job. So there's nothing wrong with sharing scriptural evidence with those who are open. In fact, we could rightly call that good. You look throughout the whole Bible, you see the apostles sharing scriptural evidence about the Messiah, for example. You see Philip approaching the eunuch in the, in the uh, cart on his way back from Jerusalem. So there's nothing wrong with that. That's wonderful. But to try to convince people is futile. It's kind of a waste of your energy, and in fact, it's using the wrong energy. It's using our human power. We should just be trusting God. We don't always do it. (laughs) God knows. But this is an encouraging message to take the pressure off of yourself. Follow God's lead in your life. Go where he wants you to go. Say something to who he wants you to say something. But your job is not to convince people. Just let the lion, the word, Jesus Christ, out of the cage. And he's the only one that can bring someone to faith in Christ. On the board we saw on Sunday from Ian Hamilton, but how does this actually work? What does the Spirit do to persuade us that Scripture truly is God's infallible word? The answer is not that the Spirit gives us revelation in addition to what's in Scripture, but that he awakens us as from the dead, to see and taste the divine reality of God in Scripture, which authenticates it as God's own word. I hope you see he's talking about supernatural things there. But believing in the word of God is a supernatural thing. Trusting in Jesus Christ for eternal life in your own heart, that's a supernatural thing that takes place that the Holy Spirit helps you do. He actually gives you the faith to believe as we've studied. 
So these are supernatural things. You know, it's not like A, B, and C and uh, all this rationalism and intellectualism to figure out if the Bible's the Word of God or not. It's read it, read it, and ask God to show you what you're not seeing. And if you're humble, he'll show you that it is the Word of God. He'll show you. It's a supernatural thing. And faith is a supernatural thing. The Spirit promises to convict. He goes on to say, Calvin says, Our Heavenly Father, revealing His majesty in Scripture, lifts reverence for Scripture beyond the realm of controversy. Again, it's a supernatural thing. God will do it. The Father will do it. As Jesus said on the board in uh, John 6.44, Part A, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. What does that tell you? It tells you that God is actively involved in people's salvation. It tells you that God is sovereign. You can't come to me in your own power or your own wisdom. You need to be humble before your Heavenly Father and ask Him to show you the truth. Then, you know, He'll draw you. But no one comes to me unless the Father draws Him. That should humble you to say you can't do it in your own power. The Spirit's also been giving us uh, the analog to the colors of red, blue, and yellow, which are the primary colors. Uh, he's teaching us to see and trust in the primary colors, so to speak. So just an example on the board. This has come up in our lessons. And please don't make a doctrine out of this, like, oh, these are the only three primary colors. It, this is an example of primary colors in the spiritual realm, all right, about what's vital as the core. For example, the gospel, the very gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't know that, if, you don't, if you're not comfortable with that, you know, read the gospel some more. But you, you've got to um, be on the same page as what the Bible says about the gospel or the good news. The inerrancy of the word, the fact that the word is perfect and whole and pure. It is God's direct revelation to us. That's a primary color. If you don't believe in that, you're going to be lost. You're going to be a fish out of water. You're going to be confused. And then the sovereignty of God is another example. He can do what he wants. He is the Lord of the universe. He created you. He lets you breathe another day. These types, types of truths are mainstays which cannot be compromised. These are like the core, the primary colors. These are the essentials. You don't have these, you can't get the other colors. So they're vital requirements for the soul to be anchored in. And when your soul is anchored in these types of primary truths, then and only then can you have peace in this world. You try doing it your own way, but <laughs> ask anybody that's a little bit older. That temporary peace is fleeting. That pseudo peace is not real. So without these types of primaries, other doctrines can also become skewed or overemphasized. We must agree on these types of basics, which are plainly found in the Word of God, just so long as you read it. And they'll give you the stability and the truth and the unity that we need. So, to continue with this analogy on the board, God has set the primary colors in the universe, and they existed long before mankind did. Long before mankind did, these things existed. God's creation. Because they're perfect and true, they are the most vibrant of colors, simple and pure. And that's how we look at the gospel, for example. Again, we're talking about spiritual anchors here, the things that can't be tainted or messed with or compromised because then you compromise truth. You even compromise, you know, or challenge God's faithfulness. On the board, it is absolutely critical that we all agree on a single standard for our primary colors, so to speak so that any mixture after that 
uh, is consistently reproduced, regardless of who's doing the mixing. Again, like if you go back to this example, oops, wrong way. Right there, there we go. If you go back to this example, these are the primaries. If, if, you, if you stray from these or, or, or mess with these, then whatever else you try to figure out in life through the Word of God is going to be off. And you're going to make it say what you want it to say, for example. So be on guard. Be careful. You know, that's why we have to read our own Bibles. That's why you don't even take, you know, past his word for everything he teaches. He tells you that. He's like, go look it up yourself. Go look it up in Scripture. Check it out and come to your own conclusions. So here's uh, the final point in this analogy on the board. And this is all review from Sunday, so I'm sorry for going a little bit quickly, but uh, purity begins with inerrancy. Purity begins with inerrancy. The inerrant word of God gives us our primary colors. It, is, it also ensures us that any secondary, tertiary, and so on colors are consistently synthesized from person to person. If we doubt the primaries, we will never unify. If you don't want to read your Bible, if you want to trust what your church says or your religion says, maybe it's hand, handed down by tradition even, and you don't want to look it up in your own Bible, well, you're going to be missing out. You might even be deceived in a certain area, and you won't be able to unify on the truth, the truth of the gospel. So, for example, Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. Uh, let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians 4, 13. Ephesians 4, 13. Boy, that took a while to open our Bibles, huh? I didn't realize it. They had a couple verses on the board, so don't get upset with me here. So unity is one of the main goals of the faith. We're all members of one body, the Bible says. If you're a believer in Christ, you're a member of his body. But if we can't agree on what is plainly stated in Scripture, or that Scripture itself is holy, if we can't agree on that, then what are, what are we unifying on? What, what's pulling us together? What truth is pulling us together? How do we know we have the truth? Unless we read and submit to the Word. So again, only the perfect Word can give us unity and stability. Look at Ephesians 4.13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So there's a unity of the faith that God wants us to come to. And look at the wonderful results in verse 14. We might call it stability. Verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Wouldn't it be nice to not be that guy? Tossed about, changing his, his views, his beliefs year to year, wondering if it's true. Um, the example came up on Sunday, I think, of Hollywood and all the different religions that f famous people follow. Because they're searching, and they just keep going with the fad, going with the most common popular thing. And they might go through five or ten religions in their life. You know, wanting stability. But the only truth is found in the Word of God. That's the only way not to be tossed here and there. Because we, we have the faithfulness of God to rely on. So on the board, having a single point of unification is one of the greatest results of being given the inerrant Word of God. It's one of the greatest blessings and greatest results. A single point of unification. The gospel. From the words of the Lord himself. Because we can take God at his word. Being a perfectly good father. We can live a life relying on his integrity. He's proved himself over and over and over. Just read the word. If you're not sure. 
His word is always good, and we can rest on that. He never violates his word. He never doesn't back it up, you know. So on the board, inerrancy means integrity. Inconsistency and lies ruin trust. A person who speaks consistently and reliably holds up a certain integrity to their essence. Remember I was saying before, if, you, if you're lucky enough to know one or two people that you can trust their integrity no matter what they say, they're going to do it. That's a real blessing. Well, that's what this is talking about, integrity. It's a rare thing. But God is our perfect example. Jesus Christ is our perfect example. So, our Lord is a perfect master, and all God asks us to do, just think about this, all God asks us to do is to trust Him. He knows we're not going to understand everything in the Word. Not, not the, the greatest Bible scholar understands everything in the Word of God. He knows that. He's saying, are you going to trust me or not? Just like a father and a little child, the five-year-old child is not, cannot understand what his father's telling him to do or why his father's telling him to do something. So it has to come down to trust or not. And we are, you know, below a five-year-old compared to God's wisdom. You have to make a decision. Am I going to believe? Am I going to trust? Am I going to have faith in the word and that he's perfect or not? That's all God asks. Remember this from last week regarding the simplicity and purity in the garden? All man was called to do was to keep trusting his good God and creator. God gave him all this awesome creation, let, let him rule over the animals and name the animals. All man had to do to have perfect life and keep perfect life was to keep trusting in God and his goodness. And he blew it. Listen to the serpent. Listen to the temptation. Is God really good? And we do the same thing. When we don't trust the word and, and it, its truth and its inerrancy, we're doing the same thing. So it's really simple. Faith of a child. God wants us to have the faith of a child. And we'll be blessed in that way if we decide to go that route. This came out on Sunday regarding God and his servants. He doesn't expect that they will always want or even agree with his decisions, but he wants them to trust him, i.e. his goodness. It's pretty simple. You may not understand or agree with everything in the word. Like, you, you know, we just don't get it all. So God's like, okay, do you trust me? I've done all these other good things in your life. Do you trust me? There's all this prophecy in the word of God. Do you trust me? I left heaven and became a man and died for your sins. Do you not believe that I love you and have your best interest in mind? So that's what it comes down to. If you decide to humbly submit like a servant, you'll be blessed because you'll have stability. You'll know he has good in mind for you. And that's the value of trusting that the Bible is the very word of God. For example, we saw on Sunday in Luke 10, 27, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And the question came up, how will you do this if you don't trust in God's word? Why would you do this if you don't trust in God's word? And God's word is what reveals to us who he is and that he's worthy of praise. Read it. It's amazing how many people don't read the Bible and don't realize what they're missing out on. Like they don't even know what's in there, right? Anyway, everyone's got to make their own choice, but it's humility versus arrogance. We have to consider the Holy Bible as perfect and nothing less. On the board, we've seen that the beauty of perfection is that you can trust it. 
If God is perfect and the Word of God is inspired by Him to a T, and it's perfect, then you can trust it. You don't have any worries about Him breaking His Word, for example, like you would man. So that, that's God's perfect goodness. And then something wonderful happens in our souls. Uh, turn in your Bibles to John 8.31. John 8, 31. If you trust the Bible is inspired by God and it's perfect, it's His Word to man, if you trust that, you're going to be blessed in your soul. God's going to open up your eyes. He's going to give you peace that is supernatural. And this is what God desires for all His children. But He can't force them. He can't make them obey. Can you, can you make a five-year-old obey? I mean, you can discipline him as a good parent would. Can you make him obey in his heart? Try that one. Right? And that's God's struggle with all of us. But look at John 8, 31. You want to be blessed? So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What's the contingency? If you continue in my word. That's it. You, you, we all want to be free, right? Who doesn't want to be free? Who doesn't want to have no fear in their life? Who doesn't want to know they're going to heaven one day? Everybody wants that. But you don't want to do it God's way. You want to invent your own way. Or cross your fingers for when you die. If you continue in God's word, if you surrender to the word as true and you read it with an open heart, God will reveal stuff to you and give you freedom in the end. Freedom to live like he wants you to live. Only leaning heavily on the truth of the word will grant you the freedom that God wants you to possess. But it's up to you. You must look at the word not only as true, but as your very lifeblood, the very source of all good answers in, in life. Where else are you going to get these good answers from with reliability? It's then that you'll have great confidence in your life, and your confidence is not based on yourself. It's based on the one who's perfect. And we can rest. Is there anything greater than that? knowing and trusting that your dad in heaven is perfect, and so is his word. And even though I don't understand it all, and there's some uh, unusual things in the Bible, say it that way, things that, like, you know, will make you take a double take. And you're like, I don't get that. Uh, cool. It's a chance to have faith. But our dad in heaven is perfect, and so is his word. So be that little kid that brings glory or honor to his father and trust him anyway. On the board, regarding the inerrant word, when you fully accept that the Bible is the perfect expression of God who cannot lie and whose will is to justify, sanctify, and glorify you, which is a miracle in itself because we're all fallen sinners, that's his will. And he can't lie. And when you read that for yourself in the Word of God, your faith becomes like our author and perfectors, Jesus Christ. It becomes rock solid. But you have to rely on, you have to lean on the Word. You have to have that humility. Be open to God showing you. It's only then that he's going to show you. He's not going to show a bratty little kid who's not humble, who's not willing. So we want to have that rock-solid faith. You have to fully accept the Bible as the perfect expression of God and from God, who can't lie. His will is to justify, sanctify, and glorify you. God knows why he even thinks about us. And your faith will become rock-solid when you fully accept the Word. How can you stand on a rock if you don't believe that rock is stable, 
You know, how are you going to be secure? You can either stand on the rock with fear and uncertainty or with unwavering confidence. God doesn't move. God doesn't lie. But that depends on your attitude or trust in the word. So back to our message title, what is good and who gets to define it? As we know, the woman in the garden was quite deceived by the serpent, and she fell for what we can now call the oldest trick in the book, literally. The oldest trick in the book is the one that the first two humans fell for in the garden. What is it? Question God's perfect goodness, his veracity, his inability to lie, his loving kindness, and his truth. That's the oldest trick from Satan to members of the human race. Question God's goodness. Remember what we just said a minute ago? All Adam and the woman had to do was keep trusting God for his goodness, and it was all around them. He literally gave them everything. All they had to do was keep trusting his goodness and not listen to the whispers, the lies. So speaking of loving kindness and truth, turn to the prophet Micah. The book of Micah, it's about somewhere in the middle of your Bible. It's only a few pages, so we'll give you a minute. But again, what does Satan want you to do? He wants you to question God's perfect goodness and veracity and loving kindness and truth. He wants you to question it. He wants you to doubt it. Satan plants seeds of doubt, sometimes through friends and loved ones. So be on the alert because most people in the world are deceived, not believing the Bible is the word of God. So what do you expect? They might love you, but they have no other understanding to share with you other than doubt. So I read this passage in Micah chapter 6, verse 6, this morning actually as part of my regular Bible reading, and I was compelled to share it with you all. Again, take one more look at the point on the board before we read this. The oldest trick in the book is the one that the first two humans fell for in the garden. Question God's perfect goodness, veracity, loving kindness, and truth. What does the word remind us of? If we keep reading it. God's perfect goodness, veracity, loving kindness, and truth. How are you going to know who God is if you don't read it? Where are you going to get it from? You're going to make it up? You're going to listen to a mystic, uh, you know, palm reader? Do you trust them? They might give you an answer. Do you really honestly trust them? There's such a thing as demons, you know, by the way. Anyway, I digress. What does the word remind us of if we keep reading it? Reading it, the goodness of God, his qualities, his characteristics, his promises. Think about it this way before we read this. Adam and the woman stopped reading the Word of God. They stopped trusting the Word of God. Back then, the Word was audible. God spoke with them in the garden. It wasn't written. But in a way, they stopped reading the Word of God. They stopped listening to the Word of God. If they kept reading of His goodness in all the perfect creation around them, they wouldn't have given in to temptation. In a way, they stopped reading or listening to the word of God himself. Look at Micah 6, 6. We have it in written form now. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take the light in thousands of rams in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you O man, what is good? In other words, are you listening? Have you been reading his word? He's already told you what is good. In other words, the first two verses there, seven and eight, does God just want sacrifices from me? Verse eight, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? The Lord has told you. Why? 
Because you just read it. That's how you know that this is what the Lord told you. How do you know that this is what the Lord tells you to do or how to live or how to be in relation with him unless you read his word? You don't. If you didn't come to Bible class tonight, you would have missed out on knowing this truth in verse 8 because you didn't open up and read the Bible with your own eyes. The simple things are the purest, and such is God's goodness. In other words, it's not complicated. God didn't design it to be complicated. You may not understand the whole word, but the word is pretty simple. Big picture, it's simple, it's direct. God is open and honest and direct with us, if we read it. How do you know, in verse 8, what is good? That's our series title, right? How do you know what is good, in verse 8, unless you read it right here? that the Lord told you. It's to follow Jesus Christ and preach Him crucified. Big picture. Love kindness, do justice, and walk humbly with your God because He's good. And He proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt at the cross. Turn to Micah 7, verse 18. Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. There, my friends, is perfect goodness. He delights in unchanging love. Unchanging. He's perfect. He can't lie. That's God. Unchanging love. And he delights in that. And that's why we can rely on him and his word. Verse 19, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob and unchanging love to Abraham, which you swore to our forefathers from the days of old. In other words, God can't break his promise. He promised Abraham a lot of things. And he has to follow through because it's his word. God doesn't go against his word. So again, refuse to fall for the oldest trick in the book, which often comes from a slithering tongue in your life that's trying to plant doubt in your soul. Don't listen to it. How about listen to the word instead? Every day we get to decide what we listen to. If you're not in the word, you're listening to other stuff from other sources, usually evil even though they have a smile on their face. And they'll say, I love you. How might we fall for the oldest trick on the board? Here's some different ways that we do it. We grope for self-made blessings, quote unquote, instead of waiting on God's timing. Isn't that great? I want it and I want it now. We all do that. And we talk ourselves into the fact that it's from God, even though I forced my way in there and got it and grabbed it. We willfully disobey the word. Right? Amen? Willfully. We do it. We know what the Bible says about certain things, and we go against it anyway. We justify ungodliness by perverting primary colors, the primary doctrines, if you will. And we premeditate all of the above and much, much more. That's the kicker. We premeditate. Stuff that we know is against the word of God. And even though God promises to bless us if we follow his word, we still premeditate our own excuses. It's something the uh, Spirit brought up on Sunday. Do you premeditate not reading your Bible? Do you kind of talk yourself out of it or figure out why you don't have to? We're, we're We're just horrible. But that's the flesh, you see? And that's why we we got to relax. We all do this. We all fail every day. God knows it. We sin every day. What does he want? He wants our hearts. He wants our surrender. He wants our repentant attitude. He knows we're going to sin. But he wants our heart. He doesn't want our desire to be sin. Our desire is for him, even though we fail at times. But we fall for the oldest trick. We doubt God. We question God. 
the oldest trick is to put God on trial. And when you think about those words, that's what we do. We put God on trial when we question his authority, when we question his word. The gall we have, huh? So God on trial. When you even think of doing such a thing, just stop right there. Repent and remember the goodness of God. Look around the Garden of Eden. Look around creation and all that God has given you. Not what you don't have. Well, we started within the beginning tonight. Thank God for what you do have. And if you don't think you have a lot, go to India next time pastor goes. And spend some time just looking around. Count your blessings. Remember the goodness of God. Stop putting him on trial. We're in the devil's world for now, but God is good. So none of us are perfect, and we don't have to sin when we're tempted. That is our choice. To be tempted is one thing. Jesus was tempted in the desert for 40 days without sin. And we're, we're going to fail. We're not him. We all make mistakes, even putting God on trial at times. Go to Job 20, verse 12. Again, God wants our hearts. Sometimes we hold on to things that are ungodly, uh, including evil thoughts and speech. And that's where our, our problems and failures usually begin and our suffering that follows. Look at Job 20, verse 12. Though evil is sweet in his, the wicked, man, wicked man's mouth, and he hides it under his tongue, though he desires it and will not let it go, but holds it in his mouth, yet his food in his stomach is changed to the venom of cobras within him. This is serious stuff, huh? Like, this isn't like, you know, it's going to taste bad or you're going to have a little tummy ache. This is talking about poison. What do we do? We accept it. We hide it under our tongue. I didn't say anything bad. I wasn't thinking anything bad. We hide it under our tongue. As wicked as we can be sometimes, holding on to evil in our souls even, God knows. And He's our Father who will even faithfully discipline us at times because He knows we need it in the goodness of his faithfulness. But he tells us when we're wrong. You know, he's honest. And he convicts us, and he, and he tells us the consequences in his word. So it's not like he's, um, you know, he's a, he's a good father. If you're listening, right? And we also saw on Sunday, a man's word is everything. We often fall short, but this is a true statement. So more so, think about God from this point of view. God's word on his word. God says that his word means everything to him. And as such, it ought to mean everything to us. If God says, this is my word, and I am the word, I am the word. Obviously, there's no room for, um, you know, hedging bets or not giving full credit to the word for what it is. And so God says it should be everything to you. Uh, that's your, your viewpoint. I want you to have that perspective. If you trust me, you'll see. All right, I'm going to skip a passage here in my notes as we need to begin to close. Go to uh, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1. Ecclesiastes 5.1. Not going to get all the way through my notes, but so be it. Uh, let's close on this thought that we're really smart if we let our words be few. Like if we be careful what we say. The tongue is a fire, the book of James says that can light a whole forest on fire. We're really wise if we watch our, our thoughts and our words. Um, 
I was thinking, how many times can you remember how glad you were when you held back from saying something? I mean, you thanked God that you didn't spit it out what you were thinking. And God solved the problem like two minutes later in his gracious way. So just think about that. Maybe we should have more of those, right? Maybe we should let our words be few and allow God to work. Look at Ecclesiastes 5. This kind of drives the point home in verse 1. Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. How do you listen? You can do that anytime you want, not just in the house of God where you are right now. How do you listen? How did Adam and Eve read the word of God? They listened. Draw near to listen rather than offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they're doing evil. What evil? Look at verse 2. Do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God. For God is in heaven and you're on earth, so let your words be few. Isn't that great? There's a good rule to live by. You do that, you're going to have a much easier life. God is in heaven, you're on earth, let your words be few. For the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words. When you make a vow, in other words, when you give your word, are you a man of your word? When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin. And do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. Simple. Stop talking. <laughs> Stop. You know, who knows what the, <laughs> our own translation might be, shut up and fear God. Stop talking. Stop blabbering. Stop giving lip service to God or to people in your life. If you're going to say something, you better mean it. Like that, because that's how God looks at it. Your word is, if you don't keep your word, you have no integrity. If you can't keep it, don't say in the first place, right? But God, see, God's perfect. His word's perfect. He said a lot, but you know what? He can say a lot. He's perfect. He has all wisdom and all knowledge, and he is love. He can say a lot, and we can trust it to a T because It's inerrant. So on the board, we'll close this way. We must first trust fully and implicitly the word of God. In our own personal lives, in your own heart, you have to surrender in this way if you want to find the truth. And the truth will make you what? Free, right? Oh, we all want the freedom. Yeah, but we try to invent our own way. The only way to true freedom is implicitly, fully trusting the Word of God. Why? Because that's how you learn how good God is and what His plan is and His tremendous love for you. If we don't read the passages like we saw in Micah chapter 6 and 7, we're not even going to know of His goodness. We won't truly get to know Him as came up last week, last week rather. The purpose of knowledge is to get to know somebody personally. It's not to write a book. It's not to be able to look impressive at parties. It's to know Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So think about this as we close. It's God's desire that it's our desire to get to know Him personally. That's God's desire. How are you going to get to know God personally and Jesus Christ personally if you don't go to his word? Where where are you getting it from? 
It's God's desire that it's our desire to get to know him personally, personally and intimately. And he's provided his very own words to allow us to know him. On the board, the word reveals to us that the author of true goodness is God and only God. As the Bible says, no one is good, not even one of us. But he is good, and he can be relied on, and he keeps his word. Again, the word reveals to us that the author of true goodness is God and only God. And that's where your stability and your peace can come from. That's how God designed it for each one of us. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your provisions. We thank you for your word, which is infallible and inspired. Even though men wrote it, you inspired them in every way, for every word. We thank you for the prophecy in Scripture. We thank you for revealing your heart in Scripture. We thank you for your promises and that you cannot lie. Father, we ask that you humble each one of us before your word, before your mighty hand, that we might truly see your goodness in our own hearts. Help us, Father, to cling to your word and lean heavily on your word, for it is the truth, and the word is God. Father, we ask that you bless us as we go, help us enjoy our thanksgiving, and give thanks to you continually for all the little things you do for us. We ask these things in Christ's precious name, and by the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you.